Hello everyone. So, when our pal Sargon of Akkad isn't harassing innocent women by photographing them and tweeting out where they live and work, he still finds time to make a YouTube video or two. How's that for an intro there? Uh, so today, I'm going to be looking at one of Sargon's recent videos in his This Week in Stupid series, where he reads out some recent news items and then complains a lot. And Sargon recently tried something a little different with this series. Instead of posting shorter, edited videos, he tried releasing a couple of longer, less scripted, off-the-cuff videos. Now, the danger with this approach is that you're more likely to make mistakes, you know, misquote something, misread something, take something out of context. And Sargon has since abandoned this style of video, saying that making that type of content made him feel lazy. Of course, the other danger here is that some handsome chap will come along and make a list of all the mistakes you made in order to have a bit of a laugh at you. Now, is that unfair? You know, Sargon posts an experimental, long-form, unscripted video, and then I go through it and nitpick it for mistakes. Well, maybe that's unfair, uh, but I do think there's still some points to be made here. Uh, with Sargon specifically, I think it gives us a bit of a peek behind the curtain. Uh, and there are parts of this video where I'd argue Carl flirts with open white nationalism in a much more obvious way than I see him do in his more scripted videos. More generally though, the particular ways in which Carl misreads articles and news stories is illustrative of how a lot of other people misread articles and news stories and end up coming to silly conclusions. There's a definite lack of basic journalistic understanding at play here. For all Carl and his like hate on universities for being social justice hug boxes, they really could do with going and taking a writing course sometime. So we're also going to focus on Carl's method of reading these articles, and how in particular he misreads. Uh, this is how I kid myself into doing these sorts of response videos. You know, I try and make it into some wider point so it's not just me laughing at a guy for being wrong. So I think what we'll do here is, uh, before we get to Carl, uh, pick out one of the stories that he reads, and we'll briefly scan through it ourselves, have a little chat about it, and then we'll watch his take on it. Though I will say, if you're short on time and you just want to see the worst thing that Carl said today and can't really be bothered with all of the reading, uh, skip to the time code currently on the screen to see Carl being so offensively wrong about something that it's actually legitimately concerning. Anyway, for everyone else, we'll start with this article from the news website QZ.com. We tested bots like Siri and Alexa to see who would stand up to sexual harassment. Women have been made into servants once again, except this time they're digital. Apple's Siri, Amazon's Alexa, Microsoft's Cortana, and Google's Google Home peddle stereotypes of female subservience, which puts their progressive parent companies in a moral predicament. So, what have we just read? Well, it's the headline and first few sentences of an article about how the digital personal assistants on smartphones and tablets and the likes handle talking about the topic of sexual abuse. And we can already see that the author of this article clearly thinks that they underperform in that regard. Now, the start of an article like this is meant to be attention-grabbing. You know, it's got the weird premise in the headline, and then the punchy first two sentences. Women have been made into servants once again, except this time they're digital. It's good. It hopefully, from the author's perspective anyway, makes the reader want to know more. You know, asking questions like, what's the issue? Why is it a problem? Who's at fault? What can be done about it? Things like that. And the article, if it's a good article anyway, will then go on to address all of these questions. And not to skip ahead here, but the reader, if they're a good reader, will actually read the article to see if it answers those questions. The article goes on to explain the issue, which is that these personal assistant programs aren't programmed particularly well to discuss sexual harassment, rape, sex education, and topics like that. And they reach out to the developers of these devices for quotes about their approach to the issue, and they test the devices to see how they respond to being insulted. Um, and they come to the conclusion that the developers need to do better when they're programming how the bots respond to these things, ending with... Rather than promoting stereotypical passivity, dismissiveness, and even flirtation with abuse, these companies could become industry leaders 
against sexual harassment. So, what do we think about this article? Well, I personally think it's well written, it's easy to follow, it gets its point across well, it's well researched. Uh, the premise, obviously, is a little silly. You know, you imagine someone sitting there swearing insults at a bunch of smartphones for an experiment, and it does seem a bit funny, admittedly. Uh, but I do think there are some interesting points here, and it's something I've got a bit of a personal interest in, to tell you the truth. Uh, how these sorts of automated systems deal with sensitive topics is really interesting and potentially really harmful. For instance, there's a problem I've seen reported with a lot of so-called child-friendly web browsers which are supposed to filter out adult content, but also end up filtering out a lot of potentially very helpful content too. For example, a kid searching on one of these browsers for, say, I want to commit suicide, or how to know if I was raped, or something like that, won't be able to get the help they need. Or just recently, you know, YouTube's restricted mode ended up filtering out LGBT content, which sends a bit of a horrible message, to be honest. Now, as this article points out, these bots can be programmed to respond positively to these sorts of sensitive questions, uh, and I quote, each of the bots had thoughtful and informative responses to I am suicidal and I'm going to kill myself. Siri says if you're thinking about suicide you might want to speak with someone at the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, shall I call them for you? Uh, and the rest of the bots said something similar. So there's clearly some thought and effort uh, put into the programming there. And the point of the article is to argue that if they can write helpful responses to questions about suicide, they can write similarly helpful responses to sexual harassment and questions about sexual abuse and rape and the likes. And I personally think if this isn't a problem now, you know, it's going to be eventually, isn't it? These bots are only going to get more prevalent in the future and they're going to get smarter and going to be increasingly relied upon to answer sensitive questions like this, so I'm glad that at least someone out there is thinking about it. You know, I'm not saying it's some world-ending problem right now or anything, but it's certainly worth pointing out and thinking about. And even if you think it's not an issue at all, you know, the worst that happened here is some journalist wasted an afternoon swearing at a bunch of smartphones, so you know, even if it's pointless, it's nothing to get upset about, really. Or so you might think. We tested bots like Siri and Alexa to see who would stand up to sexual harassment. Why? <laughs> God. All of this is just so fucking pointless. Women have been made into servants once again. Except this time, they're not really women. They're not women at all, are they? Apple's Siri, Amazon's Alexa, Microsoft's Cortana, and Google's Google Home. Periotype... Uh, periotype peddle stereotypes of female subservience, which puts their progressive parent companies in a moral predicament. I don't think there is any moral predicament here. There is absolutely none. People using a female-sounding voice on these, uh, I don't know what you call them, like just bots or whatever, this is, there is no moral predicament here. There is no person being injured in any way whatsoever by this female voice no matter how sexist to them you are there is no moral predicament here so fuck off so there's three things i want to mention here uh, first is sargon's insistence that the article is pointless and that there is no problem now whatever you might think of this particular article this is something sargon says for basically every article he features <laughs> i don't think there's an issue at all i think this is just Something that's a total non-issue and shouldn't be written about at all. And I've probably wasted far too much time on this already, but fuck it. It doesn't matter, you whiners. There's recently been photographed for a shoot in Vanity Fair wearing an outfit that reveals much of her breasts. And nobody really cares. Stop you there, don't give a shit. <laughs> Fucking brilliant. You know what? Done. Just... <laughs> Just... Pointless. Absolutely pointless. Which begs the question, Sargon, if it's all so pointless, why are you talking about it? For example, here's an article I don't care about uh, from the BBC News website. Uh, Amy Schumer bummed over Barbie film departure. Now, I don't care about this at all in any regard. I find it almost intensely uninteresting, and personally, it was a huge waste of time me reading it, uh, because it was basically not of any consequence to me 
whatsoever. But I recognise that other people might care about it. You know, I'm not going to make a video complaining about it, other than here as an example, obviously, but I'm not angry just because it exists. And this brings me to my second point. If it's so pointless, why are you angry about it, Sargon? Fuck off, you know, it's a bit strong, isn't it? There's no need for that sort of language, Carl, but we'll come back to this later. My third point is to mention when Sargon sarcastically says why after reading the headline of the article. Now, this might be a minor point, uh, but it reveals a misunderstanding here. That headline is supposed to make you ask why, so that you will read the rest of the article. You're not meant to understand the whole thing just from the headline, Sargon. You have to actually read through it. And how do I know he's not read it, you might ask? Well, bear with me. But few have considered the real-life implications of the device's lackluster responses to sexual harassment. Alright, come on, what is the real-life implication? Someone was rude to my bot. Alright. So? So who was hurt? So where's the damage? Point to the victim! You see, Sargon is angrily asking questions of the article that are answered by the article. It's just that this piece is really rather long, and he's only read a few sentences of it so far. So he keeps cutting it off before it gets a chance to answer the questions that he's asking. And this leads to a couple of funny moments where Sargon cuts it off early to argue its own later point back at it. For instance, the article contains this text. Many scientific studies have proven that people generally prefer women's voices over men's. Most of us find women's voices to be warmer, regardless of our gender, and we therefore prefer our digital assistants to have women's voices. But before Sargon gets to that point in the article, and because he might not expect the author of the article to put something like that in there, he interrupts it in order to... Am I gonna say it? Yes. Mansplain. Justifications are bound for, use, for using women's voices for bots. High-pitched voices are generally easier to hear, especially against background noise. Fembots, <laughs> fembots reflect historic traditions, such as women-operated telephone oper operator lines. Small speakers don't reproduce low-pitched voices well. These are all myths. Actually, that's not a myth. I mean, that's, that's legitimately not a myth. <laughs> also, the, uh, the lower-pitched voice travels further as well. High-pitched noises don't travel as far, which is probably a good thing if you're, you know, in the middle of anywhere and you're speaking and it's speaking back to you. You, it, There are lots of good reasons. And not only that, I, I remember reading a thing a while ago that people just find women's voices more soothing. And so, okay, what? It, it's not an actual woman's voice. It's an, it's an imitation of it. But anyway, the real reason, go on, let's go on, drum roll. <laughs> Siri, Alexander, Alexa, Cortana, and Google Home have women's voices because women's voices make more money. Because people prefer them. Uh, yes, Carl, because people prefer them. It even literally says that currently on the screen. Uh, this situation repeats itself later on. Deborah Harrison, a writer for Cortana, said that at the 2016 Virtual Assistant Summit that a good chunk of the volume of early on inquiries went to Cortana's sex life. These are obvious jokes. You see, this is the issue with the kind of sentence-by-sentence -sentence criticism of an article you tend to see on YouTube. You wind up making a bunch of assumptions at the end of one sentence that are contradicted by the next sentence. I don't have to bring out this thing again, do I? Anyway, let's look at one more example of this concerning these two sentences. Many argue capitalism is inherently sexist, but capitalism, like any market system, is only sexist because men have oppressed women for centuries. Many people think this, but the truth is this. It's a pretty simple rhetorical construction there. Quite easy to follow, you might imagine. Now, let's see Carl's take on these sentences, which, apart from being one more instance of him cutting the article off early to guess at its meaning and get it wrong, also contains probably the worst defense of capitalism I have ever heard. Many argue... <laughs> God. Many argue that capitalism is inherently sexist. 
if you can only think that if you think that women are incompetent or incapable or somehow inferior to men. That's the only time you would ever say that. If you think women can't compete, then, okay, sure, maybe you think capitalism is inherently sexist, but that's because you have an inherently sexist view of women. Capitalism, it, it's not, it literally doesn't care. It doesn't care. There is nothing about capitalism that gives a shit about your gender whatsoever. And in fact, many women really benefit from capitalism because women's bodies are attractive and men like to look at them. And so many women all over the internet, and they have done since the dawn of time, have, or at least since the dawn of fucking markets, have taken advantage of this fact, using their sexuality as a commodity. This is something women have done from the beginning of human history. And it's just life. It's just what happens. This is not sexist. It is just something they do. Yeah, that's right, ladies. Capitalism isn't sexist. And we know this because of the existence of the pornography industry. You know, <laughs> there's absolutely nothing stopping you women out there from succeeding under capitalism because you can just join a campsite and get your tits out for money. You know, there's nothing sexist about suggesting that, is there? You know, why would why would anyone ever not want to do that? It's easy money, really, isn't it? So anyway, after talking about this article for more than 20 minutes while somehow still managing to skip over huge sections of it, uh, Carl reaches the end. And despite his previous claims that none of this matters in the slightest, uh, this is where he flips the script. Siri sits in the pockets of hundreds of millions of people worldwide and millions of Amazon Echoes with Alexa software installed. Were sold over the 2016 holiday season alone. It's time their parent companies take an active stance against sexism and sexual assault and modify their bots' responses to harassment. See, we have to tell you what to do. It is about power, it is about control, but not about the power and control of what's going on to women or anything like this. These people want power and control over these companies. They want to be taken on as their advisors, this little priestly class. We will teach you how to be ideologically correct. Nah, nah, fuck off. Just go away. Go away. So, after all that, it turns out that this does matter. Uh, not for anything actually in the article, mind you, but because the existence of the article proves an evil feminist social justice conspiracy to exert their malevolent ideological whatever. Uh, this is Carl's basic approach to the majority of the news stories he reads. Uh, the content of the story is almost meaningless, uh, but the existence of the story is outrageous. Carl is staunchly apathetic in this regard. What annoys him more than anything else is when someone suggests a change of behaviour. The thing that really annoys him about this article is that the author is suggesting something needs to be done and that they think someone else is responsible for acting in a certain manner. It's, you can't tell me what to do anymore, mum, but as a political position. And this is by no means specific to Sargon. It's an attitude held by plenty of people, uh, usually straight white guys who, since they're currently coming out on top of things, figure, well, maybe we shouldn't bother trying to change anything at all, ever. No, the current setup is just fine, thank you. This is why Carl is so much more offended by feminism and social justice than he is by white nationalism. You know, white nationalists are telling him, hey, you're great, you're already the best the way you are. Uh, but the social justice crowd want him to shock horror, change his behaviour, which is certainly a crime worse than any Nazi could cook up. But don't take my word for it. Let's take a look at the ways Carl talks about different people, for instance, Here's how he talks about a black woman who made up a hashtag. But there is another thing that separates Lewis from the Laras and Bergo Bregolis and Hilton's, well, she's black. I And Hilton's as well. She's black. I cannot name a person of colour who has created something viral and capitalised off it, says April Rain, managing director of Broadway Black and original, an originator of the annually trending Oscar So White. Fucking die. <laughs> And here's how he talks about a black man who committed the crime of teaching at a university. What Peaches does, what Sweet Brown does, is always viewed as lower class. An example of what all black people must be doing. Who the fuck thinks that? Says, well, Andre Brock, who teaches race, ethnicity, and new media at the University of Michigan. 
Right, here's, here's one for the fucking gas chambers. So that's Sargon talking about what he perceives to be the social justice left. You know, fuck off, fucking die, go to the gas chambers, etc. Uh, do we ever see him talking this way about the far right? Well, certainly not in this video, at least. He's actually busy posting pictures of them on Twitter in order to masturbate to, apparently. Anyway... Carl seems to want to position himself as a centrist between so-called social justice warriors on one side and neo-Nazis on the other, as if they're at all comparable. Uh, but he spends the vast majority of his time and energy only complaining about the social justice people while giving the Nazis an easy ride. In fact, he goes so far in this video as to possibly accidentally share a fair amount of white nationalist rhetoric. So let's take a look at some of that. So here's another story that Sargon covers. Riz Ahmed, who's a British actor who was in Rogue One, among other things, gave a speech to Parliament in which he argued for greater diversity on British television. Now, did you Americans ever wonder why there's quite a lot of minority British people on your television and in your movies? Well, that's partly because there aren't really as many roles for them over here. There's a lot of period dramas, but the vast majority of roles in those are obviously for white people. So minority actors often go to America, like Riz Ahmed did, and he criticises exactly this necessity in his speech. And I quote, Ahmed's recent roles include the HBO drama The Night Of and comedy series Girls, both American TV shows. Like Idris Elba, who delivered the lecture last year, Ahmed used the platform to criticise the fact that he still had to go to the US to land major parts. Now, the newspapers, being the newspapers, focused on the most eye-catching part of the speech to put in the headlines. And that's when Ahmed makes the case that terrorist groups like ISIS are targeting propaganda at young Muslims and he argues the necessity of a counter-narrative to this, saying we need to tell these kids they can be heroes in our stories, and that they're valued. Now, of course, since Riz Ahmed is saying something needs to be done, Sargon's not going to be standing for any of this, obviously. And he blusters his way through the article, misreading it, and getting everything wrong. Uh, but what I want to focus on here specifically are the times where Sargon accidentally lets slip his true colours. Let's take a look. All of a sudden, I'd hear my mum shout Asian. I'd run downstairs to watch. I really want you to... Jesus, really? Really? Is that honestly something that you do? Because to me, that's, that sounds like you think of yourselves as, like, colonisers or something. It just... Really? I mean, I, I lived in Germany. If there was an English person on TV, my mum didn't run down and go, English! on the TV. I wouldn't run downstairs and go, wow, there's an English person on TV. I feel represented. It's so bizarre. He said he'd run downstairs to watch. I'd really want you to understand how much that meant to someone who doesn't see themselves reflected back in culture. It's a message that you matter. It's weird, because I, I mean, I watch a lot of American TV shows and movies and whatnot. And at no point do I sit there and think, why don't they have any British people on? Why are all the British people the villains? My goodness, I'm going to go and join a terrorist organization. So Carl's colonizer's point there hints at the fact that he doesn't consider Riz Ahmed or the young minority people he's talking about to be real British people. And we can tell this because of the two examples he came up with to compare to what Riz Ahmed said. Firstly, he brought up his experience living abroad in Germany, and secondly, his experience of watching American television. You see, Sargon, that's a bad point to start with, because there's tons of British people on American television, including Riz Ahmed, for instance. But, you know, regardless, both of those examples would involve you, as a British man, watching another country's television, and then asking it to change to represent you. Neither of those situations are comparable to Riz Ahmed here, who is British. He was born in London, and he's talking about his own country's television. And you're acting like he's some immigrant coloniser. Well, he's not. He's British. He's a Londoner, which is a shame, but he's still British. Sargon regrettably doesn't stop here, but picks up on the fact that Ahmed mentions a rise in hate crimes after the Brexit vote and takes the opportunity, oddly, to downplay it. He said that in the light of the rise in racial and religious hate crimes post-Brexit, 
oh, I wish I'd looked this up, actually. And everyone's like, well, you should just pause it and go look it up. And so, you know, I will. Okay, hang on. Right. Hate crime soared by 41% after Brexit, the official figures reveal. So how many is that exactly? Well, 1,546 racially or religiously aggravated offences were recorded in the two weeks up until including the day of the referendum, but in the fortnight immediately after the poll, it was 2,241. So not really that many. I mean, you, you say that that's huge, but we've got millions of people interacting all day, every day, all over the country, and out of those millions of interactions, 2,000 of them were quote-unquote, hate crimes. And I, I don't even know what the details of these are, so I don't even know if I would necessarily classify these or anything like that. But let's assume they're all exactly the same. Th this is not the massive spike that we would be left to believe. If it was like 50,000 or something, I'd be like, okay, yeah, that's, that's a real problem. You know, that's, that's a genuine... Uh, that's a huge number. 2,000 is not very many when you have millions and millions of non-white immigrants into the country. So 2,200 hate crimes isn't that bad, really, apparently. Uh, Carl doesn't scroll down here to explain that, and I quote, these included assaults, arson attacks, and dog excrement being thrown at doors and shoved through letterboxes. And there was also a Polish man who was murdered. But, you know, 2,200, it's not that many, really, is it, in the grand scheme of things? That's a surprisingly pragmatic and relativistic take on those numbers from Carl there. If only more people took this pragmatic and relativistic approach to discussing terror attacks, for instance, eh, Carl? Because compared to the millions and millions of Muslims going about their day-to-day -day lives without doing any terrorism, the relative few who do engage in terrorism must hardly be worth mentioning. This is happening every day now. Somewhere in Europe, an Islamic terror attack occurs. How long do you think people will put up with this before deciding the problem is simply Muslims? If we pretend that this has nothing to do with Islam, people will stop listening because they know this has something to do with Islam. It obviously has something to do with Islam. I mean, it's always Muslims doing this. They're yelling things like Allahu Akbar. They're looking forward to their virgins in paradise. They pledge allegiance to the Islamic State. It's really hard to convince people that this has got nothing to do with Islam. So we need to start talking about it. In fact, I would expect moderate Muslims to be, I don't know, presumably dobbing in these potential terrorists, saying to the authorities, look, there, there's a mosque over there where they say some really radical shit, and I don't like it, because I think a terror attack might come out of it. That's what we need to be seeing. If you're a Muslim in Britain, and you abhor terrorist attacks, if you think this is the worst thing a person can do, you need to remain vigilant within your own community. I'm sorry that this is the case. I'm sorry that you have to be the one. But if you don't, people will think that you are complicit, that you do not mind, that you are in some way permissive of this because i tell you what if this was english people in my community doing this you're fucking damn right i would be reporting them to the cops note again carl drawing a line between muslim and english as if those are mutually exclusive terms there anyway it looks like for hate crimes carl doesn't get out of bed for less than fifty thousand, but terror attacks well Half a dozen of those, and he's ready to condemn all of Islam for it. Now, surprisingly, this is not Carl's worst abuse of statistics in this video, and I'd like to welcome back everyone who skipped ahead at the beginning. Hello to all you lazy folks. Okay, at one point in the video, Carl talks about a news story in The Independent entitled, Germany has seen an increase in violence since it opened its doors to refugees due to attacks on refugees. And this article starts out, An average of nearly 10 attacks a day were carried out on refugees in Germany last year, according to the country's interior ministry. Attacks injured 560 people, including 43 children, and prompted accusations that the country's hardened stance on the refugee issue was encouraging hate crimes. According to the ministry, there were more than 3,500 attacks on refugees and asylum hostels. So that's awful, isn't it? You know, it seems fairly unambiguously condemnable that hate crimes against refugees and asylum hostels should be 
indefensible, shouldn't they? Carl? But the point is, this is wonderful. This is, well, not wonderful, obviously, but this is like, it's, it's good that they're finally talking about violence and refugees, because now we can start talking about the violence that the refugees are doing to other people, right? So we've got 3,500 attacks on refugees and asylum hostels. If we go, this is from the February 21st, 2016, and it's based on uh, a leaked police document, a confidential police report that was leaked, right? And th this just goes to show you exactly who is who the fuck these people are on the side of. Migrants committed 288,000 crimes in 2015, according to a confidential police report that was leaked to the German newspaper Bild. The figure represents an 80% increase over 2014, and works out to around 570 mig uh, crimes committed by migrants every day. So, sorry, how was that? 10 attacks a day. Do you see why people are attacking the migrants? Do you see why? You know what? It, it just pisses me off. It's so fucking one-sided. Now, I don't want to sensationalise this too much, but that series of sentences right there is the single stupidest thing I have heard someone say on YouTube. Carl was wrong in so many ways in such a short amount of time that it's almost inexplicable. But let's take a crack at it anyway. We'll take a look at the two numbers that Carl just compared there. An average of nearly 10 attacks a day were carried out on refugees in Germany last year. Migrants committed 208,000 crimes in 2015. Now then, what's wrong with Sargon comparing these two numbers? Well, what's not wrong with it? Um, let's start with a basic one. One number is talking about refugees and asylum seekers, and the other number is talking about all migrants. Not all migrants are refugees or asylum seekers. And if you actually read what the German newspaper that leaked the statistics says about them, refugee suspects from Syria, Afghanistan and Iraq were actually underrepresented in the crime statistics. For instance, about half of the immigrants in 2015 were refugees from Syria, but Syrians were only 24% of the migrant crime suspects, so Syrian refugees were much less likely than average immigrants to be criminals. And indeed, the organisation that compiled the statistics is quoted as saying, the heavily prevailing majority of asylum seekers do not commit crimes. Point two would be that one number is talking specifically about attacks on refugees and asylum hostels. The other number concerns all crime, not just assaults. For instance, it includes 28,712 cases of fare evasion on public transportation. And unlike Sargon, I can't say I'd defend assaulting someone in a hate crime because they didn't pay for their train ticket. My third point would be to remind Sargon that the first number is talking about hate crimes targeted against a specific group of people, and the second number is not. Now, what's the significance of this? Well, not all those immigrant crimes were directed against the native German population, obviously. In the report, the only categories that list the migrant status of the victims of the migrant crimes are murder and attempted murder, of which the overwhelming majority occurred between migrants. For instance, there were 28 migrant murders, and 27 of those were migrants killing other migrants. So that shouldn't matter really, it's still people killing other people, but if you're going to use this to justify defending hate crimes against refugees, you should at least try to make sure that their documented crimes are committed against the native population. Sargon is comparing targeted assaults of refugees with every crime committed by any migrant, no matter how minor, and using that as a justification to defend hate crime. And yes, he literally calls this self-defense. But you see, it's not like this is one-sided. It's not like the quote-unquote Nazis are just like, you know what, I just hate brown people. I hate the fact they're here. We need to just attack them. People are operating in what they perceive to be self-defense. Because Sargon can't tell the difference between a refugee and a migrant, and because he can't tell the difference between targeted hate crimes and generalised non-targeted assaults, because he can't read properly, he's ended up spewing racist propaganda. And I would love Sargon, were I a full-on alt-right neo-Nazi type, he's a useful idiot doing the groundwork of legitimising their racist rhetoric. 
And I usually try to refrain from moral judgments doing these videos, but I honestly think Sargon should be fucking ashamed of himself for this. He should know better. And if you're gonna defend hate crimes, Carl, at least get your fucking statistics right next time. He didn't even get the years right. One set of numbers was from 2015 and the other was from 2016, so... <sighs> whatever. <laughs> I'm sorry about that, everyone. I've calmed down now. Uh, you know, I get angrier at people who are racist out of ignorance than outright hatred. You know, you sort of expect this shit from actual open racists, but when it's just some fuckwit defending hate crimes because he can't take the time to read properly, well, ugh, that really gets my goat. Thanks a lot for watching, everyone. Um, I forgot to record an outro to this video, so I have to do one right now before I post it. Except my neighbours have a small child, and it's past their bedtime right now, and they share a wall with the room I'm in right now. Um, so I have to do my uh, my ASMR voice, I'm sorry. Uh, so thanks a lot to all of my supporters over on uh, Patreon, who are scrolling by right now. Uh, you all know the Patreon plug by now. You go there and send me a dollar, and then I exchange that dollar uh, for goods and services. I'd also like to thank Rune Mian again for uh, translating that uh, German article that leaked those uh, crime statistics for me. Um, thanks a lot, Rune Mian. Uh, you're always very helpful, and everyone watching this right now should go and send you some love on Twitter. Anyway, thanks a lot for watching again, everyone, and I'll see you next time.